My name is Robert Sepper. I'm at the beautiful Lake Shrine of the Self-Realization Fellowship on Sunset Boulevard in Malibu, California. I hope you're enjoying the scenery. Welcome to another Atlantean Gardens episode. Lakes provide a critical habitat for an amazing array of plants and animals, establishing a viable food chain, including bacteria, algae, plankton, insects, fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Lake biodiversity varies in different parts of the earth, but even though these habitats account for just over 3% of the earth's surface, many of them support human life. One often overlooked part of the planet, which happens to have hundreds of lakes, is Antarctica. While most of these are subglacial, meaning below up to two miles of ice, Antarctica also has some relatively small regions that are clear of any ice and snow, and there's some surface lakes in these areas which were warm enough to swim and fish in. Even the lakes deep below the ice are teeming with life, such as Lake Vostok, the largest Antarctic lake, which does not get any sunlight and may have been isolated for millions of years. The reason is underwater volcanic vents eject minerals which sustain bacteria and plankton, which besides providing food to fish and other organisms, also create oxygen another life-sustaining element which makes some of the most remote submerged parts of Antarctica theoretically habitable by humans. I say theoretically because of persistent yet officially unproven rumors that have been circulating since the alleged end of World War II that maintain many of the most technologically elite German forces did not surrender to the Allies in 1945 but survived in secret bases below the ice near the South Pole. It's relatively easy for many to dismiss this possibility because of the high degree of censorship, not only of the mainstream media, but also in Hollywood and academia, both of which also are subject to government propaganda in the name of national security. It seems logical that the subject of Antarctica remains largely classified, given the military defeat the Allies suffered in 1946 and 47, while trying to locate and eradicate any surviving colonies established by the Germans. Codenamed Operation High Jump, the United States and several Allied nations sent an armada consisting of three aircraft carriers, along with support vessels, destroyers, submarines, and 4,500 armed troops led by Admiral Byrd to Neuschwabenland, the name of the Antarctic territory annexed by Nationalist Germany during the 30s. After the fall of the Soviet Union, maps have leaked into the public domain, allegedly obtained by the KGB during their capture of Berlin, which gave directions on not only how to navigate under the ice to reach these bases, but maps of subterranean habitable land masses, which the Germans refer to as Asgard, a mythical underground oasis, which legends claim were inhabited by Nordic looking gods. As the modern field of UFOs 
has recently gained a degree of credibility with validation of unidentified craft by the Pentagon and disclosures of lunar and Martian bases by a retired Israeli official, which I covered in a prior video that I'll leave a link to in the description. The subject has been around for decades and was diligently covered by journalists even before the advent of the internet as we know it. One such researcher was May Brussel, who had a radio program that broadcast from California in the 70s and 80s. And while many people will not be familiar with her work, I'd like to play an excerpt where she discusses some of the events surrounding World War II, including Admiral Byrd and his military invasion of the South Pole. There's a situation that has been brewing for a long, long time, and I'm going into the history down there and the predictions of Admiral Byrd in 1946 and 1947 that World War III would start down in Antarctica by the Falkland Islands with Argentine Antarctica and in that area. He knew and said in a press conference, two press conferences in San Diego, Chile in March of 1947, again in July 1947, that World War III would be set off down in that area. Well, when Admiral Byrd got home, he was met by James Forrestal, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, two years later, Forrestal was murdered, thrown out of a window at Bethesda Hospital two months after he got a Distinguished Medal from Eisenhower. Uh, Forrestal was with Admiral Byrd on consultations. Byrd went down to see if Eisenhower and the Russians were correct that Adolf Hitler was down in Antarctica building secret weapons and so forth. All of the papers of Admiral Byrd are locked up top secret to this day. They're not available of what he saw and right after he was met by Forrestal, shortly after that Forrestal was murdered. And I'll give you the references on some of the books on the death of Forrestal and the meeting with Admiral Byrd. First of all, the uh, Guinness Book of Records at the end of World War II. The greatest unsolved robbery was at the end of the war when the Reich Bank Treasury was emptied of all its money and the bank vaults in Berlin were completely emptied out and the headquarters for the World Monetary F Fund in Basel, Switzerland found that they had $15 billion in circulation that shouldn't exist. There was forged money. The code name was Operation Bernhardt. There were expert forgers. And so that this is the kind of money that could finance the operations that they're describing in this book. The prelude to the operations was that the money was available and somebody was making the equipment for these people that this book is writing about and manufacturing secret weapons for the future. Now, this book claims that Hitler planned far ahead to have a colony down in Antarctica. And if you buy the maps put out by National Geographic, 1957, there's a map of Hitler staking in 1939, 1937, his territory in Antarctica. He sent polar expeditions out. This book says the secret Nazi expeditionary force was headed by Kapitän Reicher, R-I-T-S-C-H-E-R, and took place 1937 and 38, their first expeditions. They landed in the Queen Maud land and established bases there. They took over 11,000 photographs for map purposes and had a swastika flag dropped every 20 kilometers to substantiate the German claim that they had this land in Antarctica. It was a terrain claimed by Germany Germany itself for the first time, and they found warm lakes, an ice-free oasis, and an area, an unexplored area before that they gave German names, the mountains and the plateaus and so forth. It was free of ice, and there were warm lakes in this area, and other books that I have show the drawings. Now, added to the credence to these bases are the remarks of Mr. Von Ribbentrop, this book says, at the outbreak of the war, World War II. In accordance with Germany's long-range political strategy, we have taken into firm possession the Antarctic area called the New Swabia, and it will be and ensure a safe retreat in case of necessity, Mr. Ribbentrop said at the beginning of World War II. And this book has maps of the bird expedition going down after the war. 
They said Antarctica would be an ideal place for bases. There was no rust, no germs, no illnesses or decomposition, no bacillus, no flies, no bugs, and not even a common cold would survive. It would be a per perfect place to live. And they show the food and the trays for somebody like uh, Adolf Hitler, who was a vegetarian. Now, this book shows in January 1947 pictures that Admiral Byrd took of headquarters at Antarctica. Now, the, this book asks the question, how could all this have taken place in the 20th century without detection? Hardly, they say. What steps were taken to discover the truth? Question mark. What has been done about the secret bases, about their existence? Why did the world not hear about these incredible events? Obviously, Hitler's escape was soon discovered by others. There were statements of Stalin and Eisenhower and quoted sources, and they speculate the Nuremberg trial was staged as a, to show that they had surrounded and rounded up these particular Nazis. Washington, Moscow, and London decided that they had to go down to Antarctica to investigate what was happening, so they used the excuse of scientific work and set up a large expedition with 4,000 specially selected elite United States Navy troops with an eight-month food supply, 13 ships under the control of Admiral Byrd to make, in quotes, a scientific expedition composed of military types and no scientists. The U.S. Antarctic Battle Fleet left Norfolk, Virginia, December the 2nd, 1946, as battle groups in England and Norway also sent forces down. Churchill, and this is a statement of Winston Churchill, and this comes in later to the UFOs and the bases and the confusion of UFOs that have continued since. Churchill, at that time, spoke of the Iron Curtain in 1946-47, he said, in quotes, the Crusaders in Europe, this is a quote, killed the wrong pig, end quote. Churchill realized they should have destroyed Bolshevik Russia and not Germany. The general public was told that this was a research mission to locate uranium and to study the weather. Admiral Byrd undertook this with the armed observation camps that were set up because the pole, the South Pole, lies between us and our enemies, and they considered in 1947 the enemies, Germany and the Nazis, that had gone down there during the war and after the war, and that they would be trouble later, and they wanted to find out uh, these were continuous enemies because they didn't believe the war was over, and they went down there. Further questioning as to who the enemy was was asked July 7th in San Diego, Chile, of Admiral Byrd in quotations from El Mercurio, a newspaper down there. And he said the Axis powers had been only defeated and had unconditionally surrendered, but he really realized that uh, they would rise again, and he had an interview in the paper in San Diego, Chile. It was soon learned that the scientific job, the mission, the task of observing the activities of the foreign power, Nazi Germany, in the South Pole region, was part of the activity that Admiral Byrd reported back. He wanted, in quotes, to break the last desperate resistance of Adolf Hitler. In case we find him inside his new Schwabenland in the Queen Maud Land region, we will destroy him. And there were Spanish books out at the time, Hitler Esta Vivo. The United States expedition arrived and landed in Antarctica, and with them the latest in military gear and gadgets. So you see, it was a warfare military operation at that time. This isn't new to the United States or Great Britain. Bases were established and quickly expanded. Now, after they set up their bases and set up their equipment, the instruments went totally haywire. The performance gauges, the aldometers behaved in a most erratic manner, causing Admiral Byrd to abort the flight and return to his base on visual controls. The aldometers weren't working, and he couldn't fly airplanes over there. It has been reported by papers and sources previously mentioned here that Admiral Byrd had located the secret Nazi base and was approaching it when an incident took place and he had to abandon the flight and some of his planes went down. He duplicated, he saw it duplicated and was warned about Hitler being there and a new Burster's Garden called Hitler's Shangri-La. 
Now, it says that 48 hours after he located some of these bases, four of Admiral Byrd's planes were lost, some without a trace, others without any survivors. Admiral Byrd hastily abandoned all his efforts and disembarked all his force and came home. On James Forrestal, who greeted Admiral Byrd when he returned from that trip in Antarctica. I have several books on Forrestal. One is The Death of James Forrestal by Coral Simpson. They describe it as a murder mystery, not fiction. The murder of the first Secretary of Defense, uh, James Forrestal. This book came out in, let me see if I have the year here, it, by Cornell Simpson, Western Islands publisher. I didn't write down the date that that was published. I'll have to give that to you next week if you want. They said this murder was the overwhelming result of assassination plot, and it it goes into how he fell out of the hospital at Bethesda, Maryland, on an alleged suicide, but they concluded it was a clear case of murder. That's one book on Forrestal. Another one that I have, James Forrestal, A Study of Personality and Politics by Arnold Rogo, R-O-G-O-W, published in 1963, like Macmillan. May 22, 1949, James Forrestal, America's first Secretary of Defense, plunged to his death from the 16th floor of Bethesda Naval Hospital. He had been put in there for psychiatric treatment, and also when Byrd came home, as I say, he was put in the hospital for other illnesses. I don't know what they called it. They described him as an intellectual um, uh, poser, an expert on Wall Street and big business. He worked with the power elite. Forrestal had rejected Catholicism and converted. It's a story of his biography, the controversies of Forrestal, and his death, building up to his death at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and considering the links of um, Admiral Byrd and the secret papers to the Secretary of Navy, because Byrd was an admiral, and Forrestal, he was Secretary of Defense, rather, he had to report to him, and tragedies and secrets followed everything that Byrd set out to do. He set out to find the answer to some questions, and all of his machinery went astray, and planes went down, and bodies weren't found, and he gave an opinion of what was happening and warned about World War III down there, that World War II never ended, and then the fellow that he reported to was dead, and Forrestal had been put in a hospital. The Washington Post had an article this week, or just last week, March 30th, Reagan backs Antarctica study. Would you believe that's a new story? President Reagan has affirmed his administration's commitment to conduct scientific research in Antarctica with other Antarctica treaty signers. Do you have any idea of the budget the United States has mailed down to Antarctica since World War II? If you go to the uh, bookstores, the federal government bookstores, such as uh, Golden Gate in San Francisco or the government printing offices, get the back literature. I have it in my files, a lot of it, on books available to Antarctica. The building there, the shipping there, the money going there, the equipment going there. The United States hasn't let a hunk of ice sit there with a bunch of penguins on it and pretending we don't know what's going on there. This has been a place that is going to be more in the news. We've built it up and built it up, and now the chickens are coming home to roost, and I hope you're ready. Reagan asked the National Science Foundation to continue a budget for, to manage the Antarctica program. Can you imagine anything so asinine or insulting as if it hasn't been going on continuously and all that area is charted out and mapped? There's the Rockefeller Plateau, there's the Hitler area. Get your maps on Argentine and, and Antarctica and how close it is to Argentine and see what's really going on. But the real issue goes back to what Admiral Byrd saw and wrote about that is locked up in the archives. The truth of what's going to come out of there is what's locked up that we haven't yet been allowed to see. Now, last week on this program, I talked about the confrontation down at the Falkland Islands. I referred to books on the UFO, the Nazi secret weapons, the activity down there, and the uh, lining up of Alexander Haig, in particular where his loyalties are and where they're not and the role of the United States down in the Falklands. And I claim that the real story has less to do with the Falklands than it has to do with Antarctica. And if you don't have that broadcast, you can get the tape of 540 just last week. 
Monday when I left the tape off at the tape center to be duplicated and printed up the sheets that go with it, I stopped at the printers and was reading my newspaper while the copies were being made, and there was the Monterey Herald, the morning paper, with Jack Anderson's article, Threat to Antarctica, and he was saying, in effect, uh, to paraphrase some of the sentences or give them qu the quotes, he says, the Argentine invasion of the Falkland Islands may be a warm-up for future assault on Antarctica, but next time the U.S. toes may be tramped on. And he goes on to secret CIA documents that point to conditions for the aggression down there, and he leaves some of the important ones out, but he lists a few. And the CIA papers about the oil, the Argentine desire to have bases, down there and to take the Falklands and the controversy with the British and the CIA and the, the Argentine destroyers at one time um, sought to halt the British research vessels but they didn't succeed and Britain held on to the Falklands for a long time and I'll go into a little history of that. He says there have been similar tensions over the Antarctic. The CIA has documents calling overlapping claims of the United Kingdom Argentine and Chile on the Antarctic Peninsula. And this is about the conflicts going down there that what they really want and what will bring the United States in is Antarctica and not the Falklands. And then Jack Anderson writes, my associate Dale Van Atta, who recently visited Antarctica, found the Argentine has been forceful in pressing its territorial claims. Now isn't it interesting that he's down there because, see, the average person thinks that Antarctica is just a lot of ice with a lot of penguins and nothing else going on, and all you have to do is get your ge National Geographic maps going way back for 20, 30 years, and you realize there's a lot of building, construction, and locations and places there that are more than fascinating to study. And I mentioned last week the expedition of Admiral Byrd that was a top secret visit. And on the map of Antarctica, the National Geographic one, there's an area that says the most surprising discovery of Byrd's operation called High Jump in 1947 was a so-called oasis here ice-free blue and green lakes, really inner arms of the sea, were scattered among 300 square miles of bare brown hills. Brown hills, ice-free areas, green lakes, Admiral Byrd, 1947, those were the areas that are top secret, that we're not allowed to see, that are locked up or destroyed. And those are the areas Admiral Byrd was talking about in the Chilean press on his way home and then the documents were locked up. Uh, you haven't seen much in the last years at all, even though these maps have been public for a long time, nobody seemed to take note. Now last week I was talking about space stations down there and activity down in that area that has not been in the public eye uh, very much yet, but it will. And I want to read a, just a couple of pages from a book called Messengers of Deception by Jacques Vallée. Valet wrote this book in 1979 about spaceships. He wrote in 1979, let me summarize my conclusions about the UFOs, he says in the introduction, beginning of his book. The UFOs are real. They are an application of psychotronic technology. They are physical devices used to affect human consciousness. And the reason I'm reading this, for those of you that didn't hear the program last week, is that there is a lot of literature and a lot of hard evidence that the UFOs are man-made and they're made down in Antarctica by the Nazis as weapons out of Argentina and into Antarctica and with the United States technology also in collusion with the United States Air Force and NASA and Nazi scientists. And that's why this area is so important. He says, they may not be from outer space. They may, in fact, be terrestrial-based manipulating devices. Their purpose may be to achieve social changes on the planet. Their methods are those of deception, systematic manipulation of witnesses and contactees, covert use of various sects and cults, control of channels through which the alleged space messages can make an impact on the public. He says the UFO researchers must realize that this involves, he says, politics. The UFOs will make an impact on our social reality. They are part of our political reality. They will show, the, his book, he says, will show the brutal consequences of the models, the way the UFOs are used. 
the apprehension that will give people leading to the mutilation of animals that are taking place throughout the western states are part of this psychological manipulation. He said, a friend who read this book in manuscript told me not to publish it. That's not what America wants to hear, he said. America wants the UFO to fly down from heaven like the close encounters of the third kind filled with new hopes for mankind. America wants a shiny spacecraft to replace the deflated balloon of its religious values. If UFOs are connected with unexplained mutilation of cattle and with behavior modification on a grand scale, America doesn't want to know about it. Now, he goes into the, what in re, England began as the Martian conspiracy. Incidentally, the arrival of the Martians was a sensational success. The Orson Welles show in New Jersey in 1938, the, the story of the Martians. So a, the British intelligence used the title of the Martians, and he said in his book it was used by British intelligence during World War II. It had nothing to do with the Red Planet. It's a spy industry created to keep the, the Allied command informed on the, mood and the moves and intentions of the Wehrmacht, of the German uh, government. And it goes into the lies um, that the intelligence system needs and the subterfuge and the magic to keep people off their guard. And it, ICS in London was set up by Winston Churchill. It was called the controlling system, the ICS. And it was a special, it was weaponry by special means of disinformation. And the work of the Martians was to manipulate people, friends and foe alike, and keep them off their guard. Now, the London Control Section, LCS, set up by Winston Churchill to use special means, was run by a Colonel John Bevan. It, uh, they had uh, members, a Major Morley, Derek Morley, a financier and financier and shipping magnate, a major Noel Gordon Clark. They used a Professor Neville from um, a, another well-known person in British society. And they had links to uh, various people in espionage that went into the Middle East, Colonel uh, Sir Ronald Wingate. Wingate was the son of Wingate Pasha of the Sudan, a cousin of Lawrence Arabia, who was also in British intelligence in the Middle East. Leading businessmen, shipping magnets, a millionaire industrialist, uh, large uh, spies were used in the LCS, the London Control System of Winston Churchill, and they used the number XX double cross. But what they were going to do is manufacture and deliver uh, intelligence that was confusing to people. And the beginning of this spy system during World War II then was transferred over to the disinformation department of the UFOs and the flying saucers while the Nazis could continue to build those weapons down in Argentina or in South America. If they are man-made, that's where they're coming from. Uh, Jacques Vallée had six consequences, social consequences, of this kind of disinformation operation, and I'll just read one of these to you or two. He said, the belief in UFO would widen the gap between public and scientific institutions. Someday our society will pay the price for the lack of scientific attention given to the UFO phenomena that we should have had, that the scientific will fight uh, the other person who wants it to be spiritual and break them into where they should have applied the scientific principles and studied it right away. And then he says another motive is the irrational motivations of people based on faith are spreading hand in hand. As things go bad, we want to believe in something. It has no scientific basis that it's coming from another planet or another place, and we'll hold on to it, and it will split us apart on what we believe in. I know this is true because I'll do a lot of research on one subject, such as the Kennedy assassination, and then other researchers will say, well, stick to Kennedy and don't get to UFOs because they're impossible and that's off the wall. And it divides you from studying them simultaneously with each other and then coming to the same conclusions or differing based on actual evidence. And that is one of the purposes, to divide opinion and break people up while the activity was going on. For those of you who have the book, The Crime and Punishment of I.G. Farben, the large chemical compound that has been written up as being the network for, again, the, the supremacy, the end of World War III, fi finalizing World War II and controlling us through corporations and chemicals. During World War I, uh, this, uh, the chemical compound in Germany needed gunpowder. They needed uh, salt 
uh, they had to go to Chile for saltpeter. They had to get synthetic ammonia in order to make gunpowder, and they had to scale the world and find out where to go it. They had to convert the ammonia into nitric acid. This is the book on IG Farb, and the munitions industry needed nitric acid. And they looked around for um, various areas where they could get it from, particularly from Chile. And then there was a shortage in nitric acid during World War I. And all of a sudden, the German Admiralty, according to this book, devised a bold and imaginative plan worthy of the stakes involved. The goal was to capture the British-owned Falkland Islands. This was during World War I, an unfortified coaling and supply base for British naval vessels at the tip of South America. These islands were the southernmost hinge of the British blockade, standing guard over trade routes from the west coast of South America to Europe. Their mission was to capture the Falkland Islands, and they embarked on what they called the Battle of Nitrogen by going down to Chile and South America and getting the nitrogen they needed for their gunpowder. The British Admiralty learned of the presence of these ships off of Chile and the German commander, and they sent down ships and stopped this uh, grabbing of the Falkland Islands at the time. They were able to put the Germans off of grabbing the Falklands, which was important, the harbor there, and for shipping and so forth. And it goes into the fact that Winston Churchill, in his book, uh, After the War, The World Crisis, doesn't mention the Falkland Islands, and they said he apparently didn't know its importance. But Winston Churchill was very much a part of an area that I'll go into at a later time when the war was over, when he said we fought the wrong person, when he helped the Nazis, he realized he should have fought the Soviet Union, and I don't believe that Winston Churchill knew that the Falklands wasn't important. I think he left it out of his book because at the end of World War II, the Falklands and Antarctica were already built up and were getting built up, particularly the Antarctica area. So that the Germans had to turn back and the Germans dye stuff industry uh, had to go other places. They were looking for bromine, chlorine, and so forth down in that area. But Falkland was important there for raw the war materials in World War One. so you know that it's important right now. And it's been an area uh, that we haven't been taught about in our schools in geography, but other people have watched it very carefully. The conflict of the Falklands is the sea routes, the entree to Antarctica. Antarctica has been built up for years. It was staked out in the 30s by Admiral Byrd, by Adolf Hitler in late 30s, 38, 39, that there is atomic energy down there. There's desalinated water. There are roads and industry. It is a prototype for space stations. It controls that area, controls three major seas. It is strategic for future wars, star wars, space wars, and yet the British, the Americans, can't really talk about what it's doing there, what the trouble is, because we armed this thing secretly. We have had secret passes to get there. It is one of the best kept secrets of the past 30 or 40 years. The uh, bringing of Nazis to this country, to Antarctica, to Argentina, to South America with the technology for the weapons for the next war. Spotlight also has a story, Britain terrified by gaucho bomb. Uh, we told you an article last February the 8th, Argentina had nuclear capability and how it was achieved. And they say now the media is trying to blame the Nazis behind it. Uh, it's not just Nazis alone. It's a lot of big money that has allowed the Germans to transfer this technology from Germany down to Argentina. Sure, the German scientists and the Nazis designed it, but it's very important to know that not Nazis alone have made this mess in these various countries. And the Falklands are important because they're necessary to study for what the major media has kept from you in terms of technology, of military hopes for the area, how it will be controlled because the goal of Adolf Hitler and the Fourth Reich and the Bormann Brotherhood was to control, control the airways. The satellites, the space stations are more important even than any single armies. And those are the places where the launching can be done. Admiral Byrd said it in the 40s. It's been proven and tested down there, and that is why it's an important area. I have been talking the last three weeks about the Falkland Islands and the Antarctica connections to Argentina and the importance of Antarctica to uh, world affairs. This is an area that's been long ignored by uh, persons in 
teaching geography, teaching history, it's up to us to find it for ourselves. But I have reason to believe that Antarctica is much more important than uh, we were even directed to find. Oh, here, Matthew, are we on now? You're on. Should I start over? No, uh, no, you're okay. Keep going? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we better start over just in case and say it's May Brussel, broadcast number 543, May the 2nd, 1982, just in case it didn't get on the tape. Uh, regarding the Falkland Islands, the Argentine conflict with Great Britain. The last three weeks I've been going into Antarctica and the importance of Antarctica in terms of history, of what's down there, of what has been um, linking the possible Nazi connections, the UFO connections, the space stations, what is going on in Antarctica and uh, some articles in the New York Times and a few other articles, very few have brought out the importance of Antarctica to the Falkland Islands and to Argentina. But this is an area that, uh, as I just briefly said before, if we were on or off the air, I'm not sure at that time, uh, we were never taught in geography classes what was going on in Antarctica. And while there's a lot of literature out about the area, I have never really pursued it or looked for very much in the many articles that have been published, except that I do take a bulletin from the government on Antarctica development and do cut out articles from time to time. And this week I went in, into depth into three articles that were in the National Geographic that I outlined on this particular area to see what I had missed in the past, to go back and just look at some of the things that are happening down in there, because I do think it has a lot to do with controlling the entire area what Argentine would have if they would get Great Britain out of the area, what they would be controlling in terms of not only oil and mineral and resources, but what else is going down there. Now, the March 1964 National Geographic had a section on uh, Operation Deep Freeze that began in 1963. That was the year that John Kennedy was assassinated. That was quite a long time ago. And they used those controversial Lockheed C-130s to take large staffs of people down to Antarctica. The C-130s came into the news recently with regards to the Western Airline and Neil Burke and the delivery of C-130s, these huge transports to Gaddafi that the government had stopped the shipment that we had held them up in Atlanta, Georgia, and didn't want uh, Gaddafi to have these huge planes. But what I didn't realize was that in 1963 and 1964, the United States had large C-130 transports that they were taking from Andrews Air Force Base, which is part of the space shuttle program, down to Cape Town in South Africa, and then down to Argentine. And that there were stations in Antarctica, five run by Great Britain at the time, four by Chile, and three by Argentine, and that these airplanes could fly 4,700 miles from Cape Town, South Africa, and they could carry 3,600 gallons of, of 3,600 gallons of gasoline or 145,000 pounds of fuel for each plane, that the process for delivering large amounts of equipment was possible as far back as 1963, that Lockheed C-130s, those huge transport planes, and that they used them, according to the National Geographic, to uh, take a lot of equipment down to Antarctica and also to study the stresses of hostile environment for possible use in space, which I read later in the New York Times just several weeks ago, the importance of Antarctica in terms of uh, space laws or how to manage uh, space colonies, the laws that apply to Antarctica or to space colonies or colonies on the moon. But this goes way back. The development uh, began a long time ago, and the technology for moving large amount of people and equipment began. And this one National Geographic article says that Antarctica will serve as a way station between South Africa and Australia. It was serving, this was early in 1963, and in 1962 we had begun to uh, send the huge transports. And one of the first people to go down there with this operation of the C-130s was Lowell Thomas, who was a famous newscaster who was strongly identified and linked with the CIA. 
Another article I read about Antarctica that was even more interesting, the National Geographic October 1968 was just a mind boggler. And the title of that article that I had is Antarctica, the icy testing ground for space. And I looked at the issue, which I never was aware of before, of who was on the board of trustees of the National Geographic, because this particular article had such shocking information in it in terms of what is happening in other places around the world today. And on the board of directors was Lawrence Rockefeller, Juan Tripp, that's T-R-I-P-P-E, who was chairman of Pan American World Airways, and that's the airline that was trying to get monopoly of all the routes to South America and down to this area, and they fly Navy planes down to Antarctica. This was in the National Geographic article. Their Pan Ams are available for the Navy to fly down there also. Uh, this last week, Eastern Airlines was given the route that Braniff had to stop the monopoly of Pan Am throughout South, entire South America. But Mr. Tripp was honorary chairman of the board of Pan Am World Airways, was part of National Geographic Society. And Earl Warren, the great Chief Justice of the United States in 1968, now Earl Warren headed the commission to investigate the murder of John Kennedy, and there were Nazis involved in Argentine that he covered up in his investigation purposely. He had information that he could have pursued down to Argentina of the links to Lee and Marina Oswald and to Lee Oswald in the Dallas-Fort Worth area with Walter Dornberger and the space program, the uh, Werner von Braun and the Nazis that were linked to Bell Helicopter spa Aerospace in Texas. Uh, Earl Warren had covered up the Nazi connections of those persons down in Argentina and in this area, including Werner von Braun, who would travel down to Antarctica. He was a visitor down to see these station stations that he called future moon stations. Earl Warren was on the board of the National Geographic and also Curtis LeMay, former Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force and Mr. William Martin, Jr., Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. There was quite an interesting group and James Webb of NASA, the Administrator for NASA. And NASA, NASA, Werner von Braun and Walter Dornberger were named in the Torbett document and in other information as one part of the five-pronged group that were involved in the killing of John Kennedy. And uh, the Rockefellers had given uh, money and identification to George de Mornschild when he was suspected of being a Nazi war criminal. He was Lee Harvey Oswald's close associate. So on the board of National Geographic, with the activities going down in Antarctica, a lot of activity. There was Lawrence Rockefeller and Mr. Tripp from Pan Am, Earl Warren, James Webb from NASA, and Curtis LeMay, and the head of the Federal Reserve System. Now, this one article uh, says that over the past 75 years of National Geographic, and this was dated 1968, up to 1968, they had more than 70 articles on Antarctica, and I was never aware myself that there was such a large amount of information accumulated about this particular area and what was going on. And they said that men now live and work at the South Pole. They have for dozens of years, and there's at least 40 scientific outposts. Now, this was in 1968 that there were four stations there and uh, outposts going on all the time down at the South Pole. This article also said that they had a nuclear power station in Antarctica. And I mentioned several weeks ago the possibility and references of the man-made UFOs coming out of the uh, Antarctic area in the South Pole linked to the Argentine military regime and the Nazis in South America. This one National Geographic in 1968 said they had a nuclear power station. They had a nickname for it called, well, it's so ridiculous. It was called Nuki Poo. Okay, that's our nuclear power station that they generate electricity from atomic heat and they distill fresh water from the sea for a settlement of 1,000 men in the summer and 200 during the fierce winter at this one station. Now, National Geographic, with a long list of uh, scientists on the board, in addition to these other people, is saying that they distill fresh water from the sea. And I'm wondering about droughts in Biafra or Nigeria, Liberia, Kenya, Ethiopia, 
with masses of starving people, huge masses of humanity that you've seen on television, on World Vision, and I've done programs on this before, uh, being allowed to die because the area is dried up, there's drought, there's no food, and uh, large groups of Christian organizations coming in and teaching them that if they turn to Christianity, God will save them. And huge masses of people, 10 to 20 million, dying every year from drought and lack of water. And how is it possible that they are desalting water for people living down in Antarctica? Either uh, I'm not reading this correctly or there's something going on that most of us are not aware of. And I really believe that that is the truth because I know during at the end of World War II, the Germans had sulfur medicines and prescriptions that the United States didn't get for a long history of years. And there's certain countries that have cures for conditions and health uh, situations that this country doesn't have. And we prolong illnesses where other cures are available in other places. Now, if there is atomic energy down there and if there is fresh water from the desalting, then the droughts and the genocide that's going on of the large masses of population has to be purposeful because if you can provide the technology from the tip of the ocean down the South Pole, you could be doing the same thing around Africa or Central America or wherever there's droughts. So the, this one particular issue in 1968, uh, October 68, talks about desalting water and that's how they live down there. They also, this article also talks about biologists from the Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech and how they study psychology and uh, how men would live under stress and cramped into isolated uh, spaces for future face space stations and colonies uh, up in space and moon colonies. Well, the people like Jacques Vallée have said that the UFOs are man-made and the sightings predominantly are coming out of the Antarctic area and it seems that there is this tremendous technology that many of us might have overlooked if you can believe National Geographic and their sources and again this 1968 issue has a picture of those huge airplanes the C-130 Hercules coming in and supplying laboratories and it says they built uh, large uh, roads and, and this construction work and it goes into the use of bringing in equipment to Antarctica and the South Pole by the Lockheed C-130s and there evidently is a lot more building than we know is going on and it describes the building and the road construction and the housing and the open water that's available and there's a picture of dry areas similar to the Mesa in Arizona that many of us don't associate with the South Pole. This article, the same article says the Navy chartered Pan American Airlines um, down there as early as 1957 down to Antarctica. And that same issue shows an area in Antarctica. It says one of the strangest regions in Antarctica is the Scott Coast. Behind that area, there's the towering Royal Society Range. There's valleys that are ice-free, desert-like, like the Mesa lands of the American Southwest. And it goes in, again, I've, I described brown hills and clear water. It's at Wright Valley and several others like it slope inland rather than to the sea. And there's the Onyx River, a stream that bubbles and it seems to go up head towards a lake, a Lake Vonda. And they tell about, uh, tell about drinking water, icy water from the, the lake and uh, having a hot tub and refreshing themselves on a desert in Antarctica that doesn't have snow or ice at all. So that you get a different view when you read some of the back issues, which I started to do, of Antarctica. I don't have all 70 that they published up to 1968, but a few of them. And in, the, in terms of chronology, by 1968, according to this issue, travel to Antarctica is almost routine travel like going to any distant land. In 1968, they started Operation Deep Freeze, which was supposed to be scientific research. In 1968, the C-130s had uh, airlifts of scientists and the huge Hercules airplanes, and they made daily flights around areas uh, visiting uh, different stations. And the same article refers to diesel bulldozers, huge tractors, trailer trucks, graded roads, 
cargo ships with icebreakers that came and went, and that they had, as I say, the use of nuclear power down there since 1963, and that they wanted to make a prototype for living future uh, on the moon, and that in January 68, Werner von Braun was there. He was there lots of times, but this just mentions one particular time, as well as biologists and physicists and psychologists studying people's reactions to um, living under these cramped conditions. So this has been a place of building. Uh, I knew that there was a lot of money going down constantly. I mentioned that on the program before. There's a lot of building, that, something that we can't even visualize I, how much there is. And it could be that Jacques Vallée's interpretation of world, where those UFOs came from could indeed come down from the same place as the atomic energy that could fuel those very UFOs that he says are man-made that are seen all around the world, but particularly down in that area. Another National Geographic uh, article in 1976, of June 76, tells about the National Foundation in going down there in Antarctica in 1966. And it gives a little history of Admiral Byrd and his first exploration. And I talked several weeks ago on the secrecy of Admiral Byrd's papers of what he saw in 1946 and 47 that are locked up. But he went down there in 1933. This says Richard Byrd spent time down there in expedition. He was appointed honorary postmaster of Little America in 1928 to 1930. The National Geographic Society encouraged and helped finance Admiral Byrd to go down for his second expedition from 1933 to 1935. So 1928 to 1930, he was encouraged to go down to the South Pole in 1933 to 35 was the next expedition. So the, when the National Geographic published a map in 1957 and again 1963 of an area that Hitler was anxious to have a German foothold in in 1939, uh, that doesn't sound so bizarre. Why wouldn't Adolf Hitler stake out a place from 1938 to 39 if Admiral Byrd is down there from 1933 to 35? The Americans were down there, the American military were down there, the scientists were there. So the Germans certainly kept up and were more advanced than us on many of the technologies for surviving down there, I'm sure. And they had the rockets and missiles that we brought to this country as soon as World War II was over and brought the scientists, as many as we could, to the United States and to the space program. So uh, Antarctic area, the South Pole, was not unknown to the Germans any more than Admiral Byrd, and it was an isolated thing that they staked out this area and uh, began to develop it with all the equipment and huge planes, which seems they've been doing all along. And as I said before, I think the interesting thing is how early the atomic energy was down there. We can't seem to get atomic energy going in this country at all, and our our plants like the Three Mile Island or down at San Luis Obispo or 30 other uh, plants have been temporarily shelved or they're not working. Uh, what techniques do they have down there that have worked continuously? We haven't read about any leaks or any problems. And what way do they support themselves with water? Are they desalting themselves uh, the water and drinking out of the same ocean that all of us assume can't be desalted yet? Maybe they have a technique they've used for 20 or 30 years that has not been shared with the rest of the world, which would be a good tool, a weapon, uh, being able to sustain their own water system. Obviously, that's being done down there and nowhere else it seems in the world, or at least we're not told about it. Another friend sent me an article from National Geographic, April 1962, and it showed John Connolly uh, with Admiral Byrd. Connolly was Secretary of the Navy, and he was active with the uh, astronauts, of course. And on the stand, there's a, a picture of them. Old comrades here, John Connolly, Jr., then Secretary of the Navy, praised Byrd's determination and sheer grit for going down to Antarctica. Well, John Connolly worked, if you've read the Torba document, worked with an organization called Permindex, that worked with NASA and Werner von Braun, who was frequently down in Antarctica, and Walter Dornberger from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
uh, Dornberger lived in Texas when John Connolly left the Navy and became the governor of Texas. And they were both involved in the planning and the cover-up, at least the cover-up, of the murder of John Kennedy. And I believe Dornberger had an even more insidious role. He had Warner Von Braun in that particular assassination. But the National Geographic has not only Earl Warren on the board of directors and works closely with NASA and Von Braun, but John Connolly is uh, giving accolades to Admiral Byrd, and Byrd had come home and kept secret his uh, relationship to what he saw down there on his military mission. That is the, really the answer to the future of the Falklands or the British Argentine struggle is how much is going on down there and what are we uh, not being told about the area. That is the uh, bottom line, and I can't begin to guess which way the Falkland affairs will come out because it seems that there's a lot of hidden history that has accumulated over the past 37 years that we are not yet privy to. They're just little bits and pieces. While many of the topics May Brussel brings up regarding Antarctica are very controversial, especially regarding German UFO technology, since the secret of flying saucer propulsion is also the key to the dream of universal free energy, which is classified and kept from the general population by oil companies that have maintained a monopoly on energy. That said, what was arguably even more controversial was her quote regarding Churchill when comprehending the degradation of cultural Marxism and Stalin's totalitarian communism and the mistake of letting him consolidate power, Churchill reportedly exclaimed, we have killed the wrong pig. A similar quote was made by General Patton after the end of the Second World War when he said that America defeated the wrong enemy. Of course, the powers that be are more afraid of people waking up to the truth about World War II than any other topic, which is evident by the degree of censorship that exists whenever the official narrative is challenged. One can't help but wonder, what if Churchill, Patton, or the soldiers that died during World War II could see the world today? Would they still volunteer to fight with the same patriotism and optimism? Or would they look at the corrupt media, world leaders, and question who the real enemy is? My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.